I decided to make yet another video on the uh, topic of the human ear, just because there's so much confusion around the, uh, the physical quantities of the song scale, the font scale, and uh, what do I need to know, what do they mean by different, different uh, relationships, and really this is a lot of physics, this is a lot of physics, so I don't really expect it to be very intuitive. But if we can answer some questions, maybe we'd get an idea as to what can I expect. So these questions are based from some things that I've seen in past papers and some people that said that this is what they were asked about. And I also took some, uh, some information from the minimals. So let's get started. Let's get started. So first of all, I really want you to pause this video. Pause this video and try and figure out all these fill in the blanks. I know there isn't a word bank and I like it that way because it makes it more difficult. So if we can do it without a word bank, we can sure as hell do it with so pause this video now. Perfect. Let's get started and let's see if we can make sense of it all. The relationship between stimulation and consequent sensation is, well, we already talked about the sensation. We mentioned that it's not one-to-one. -one. It is logarithmic. The isophonic curves describe sound, something producing the same something of sound. So first of all, before we take a look at that, the isophonic curves, the isophonic curves are these curves, switch color here, these curves right here, these curves. These are the isophonic curves. So the isophonic curve for the zero phon is this. That means that all the frequencies along this curve are going to have the same uh, zero phon. So they're all going to have the same, the same loudness sensation accompanied. And that means that if I jump to the next, to the next isophonic curve, jump to the next isophonic curve, the level loudness of 10 phone, or you can say the first level loudness because it's just the first line here. If I jump to it, all the frequencies that are going to be uh, in, in the same position here as far as their respective intensities are going to have 10 phone accompanied and, uh, and associated with them. So let's see if we can go, get at that question again. The isophonic curves describe sound, something producing the same something of loudness. And we know that they're producing, if they're the same isophonic curves, if they're on the same isophonic curves, they produce the same sensation of loudness. So same sensation, same sensation of loudness. And whenever we're talking about loudness, it's pretty much going to be the sensation of loudness. So the isophonic curve describes sound, something producing the same sensation of sound. So let's see what we have. If we're producing the same sensation, the same sensation, what is different really? What is the difference? Well, the difference is in, is in this. It's in the Y scale. And the Y scale really means the intensity, the intensity of sound. So for different intensities, I can have the same level of loudness on the same, uh, on the same isophonic curve. So the isophonic curve describes sound intensities. Sound intensities producing the same sensation of loudness. Very good. Let's switch color. It's nice that way. The ossicles cause the something of inbound sound waves. And we learned that they have two roles. One of them is, uh, is mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage. And the other is an acoustic bridge. Very good. So these two cause the amplification amplification of sound because we mentioned that the outside environment of the outer ear is air and the inside environment of the inner ear is aqueous and when air goes through the uh, acoustic boundary between air and liquid it loses 99.9 percent .9 roughly of its intensity we don't want that to happen sorry of its energy we don't want that to happen so we use the ossicles we ossicles cause the I would say amplification amplification of inbound sound waves. Very good. Very nice. Let's do red. The font scale is something. Point represents the threshold of hearing for acoustic frequencies. All right. And if you're wondering what acoustic frequencies is, acoustic frequency is really the uh, limit or the, I would say, the range, range of human hearing. And this is really what I do in an exam. If there's something that I want to correct, or rearrange, I just do it 
on the actual on the actual exam, and I'll show you how I do it with uh, with the true and falses pretty soon. How I correct and how I look at it. But basically, I can say, and if I don't want to be too physicist-like, the font scale something point represents the threshold of hearing for a uh, range of human hearing. And let's take a look at that scale. And what is the threshold? The threshold is here. Anything under it, I wouldn't be able to, to hear. And this threshold is zero font. So if I am on the zero font isophonic curve, I wouldn't be able to hear, or that would be the threshold. And what did they ask about the threshold? Yes, they did. So the font scales, I would say zero, zero point. Zero point represents the threshold of hearing. This makes sense. Let's see if we can move on. Let's do green now. Vibrations of the something interact with the something and cause something due to influx of something. I'll tell you right away, this is very, very difficult. I've made it as difficult as I can. So first of all, we know there's influx. And when we're saying influx, it should clue us in to some ions going in or out. And the only, the only idea that I can think about as far as uh, the hearing process, I can think of the hair cells. Hair cells, very good. And these hair cells, um, they have these, these stereociliums that have bridges between them. And when they're pulled back, potassium is going in. So really, yeah, there's an influx of potassium. Potassium. All right, we're getting there. There's an influx of potassium. Um, all right. Vibrations of something interact with something and cause something due to influx of potassium. And we know from action potential that when we have an influx of ions, let's just say I have a negative, this is the graph, this is the graph of the action potential, just a reminder, and I have a negative 70, and I have influx of some sort of ions. In this case, it could be sodium. It could be any positive ion that's entering the cell. It's going to cause, cause it to be more positive. So this, this is called depolarization. We know this. We know this. It would cause a depolarization. Depolarization. All right. So let's see. Vibrations of something interacts with something and cause depolarization to the influx of potassium ions. <clears throat> so far, so good. I'm liking it. And we already know that this happens in the hair cells. So where can we cram this in? Vibrations of the hair cells interact with, I don't know. I'll just put the hair cells here hair cells. And what vibrates and interact with the hair cells? Well, we already know that in the cochlea, the hair cells, if this is the hair cell, they have a contact with the membrane called the, the tectorial membrane. And I can, I can just write the membrane if I'm not sure what it's called, or I can write the tectorial, tectorial membrane, tectorial membrane. <clears throat> Very good. And obviously, if we can do this uh, without a word bank, we can do it with. But I'll just give you a heads up. <clears throat> I try not to use the word bank because oftentimes it put words that co-mingle and kind of confuse you. But sometimes if I can't find some sort of something, I defer to the word bank. But usually I don't like using it. And if we don't use it in this exercise, maybe, maybe uh, an exercise with a word bank is going to be easier. All right, so we're going to keep on going to our true or false. And again, I would urge you to pause this video to ponder these questions and see if you can tackle them on your own. So pause the video now. All right, let's get this show on the road. And often with true or false, what I like to do is I like to read a question. And if it doesn't make sense to me, rearrange it. And then if I rearrange it and it makes sense to me, I would mark a false. So let's see. Higher frequencies are interpreted further away from the oval window. This is something that you just need to remember. But it doesn't make sense to me. I would say, um, if, I'm, if I change that and say closer, let's see if this makes sense to me. Higher frequencies are interpreted closer to the oval window. And this makes sense to me. This makes sense to me. I know this is true. So I would mark a false for the entire, for the entire statement. And then read it again. Higher frequencies are interpreted further away from the low, from the oval window. You could actually say, you could actually fix this and say lower. And I wonder what also makes sense. Lower frequencies are interpreted further away from the oval window. Very good. Okay. Next. When the oval window moved inward, moved inwards, move inwards, the circular window moves the same way. When the oval window moves, this is actually this should be moves. Should be moves. When the oval window moves and where is the circular, the circular window moves the same way. And for that, let's just draw this real quick 
the stretched out cochlea. Very good. And we have the oval window and we have the circular window. And we know that this whole cochlea is an aqueous solution. And we know that liquids are incompressible. So if I apply a certain direction of pressure here, this window maybe stretches a bit. But this would have to go out a bit. OK, and this makes sense. So let's read it again. When the oval window moves inwards in this direction, moves inwards, the circular window moves the same way. It would not really move inward. It would move outward. It would move outward. And if I wanted to make this, make this uh, into a sensible sentence, moves the, I would say, opposite. I would say opposite. Let's try and read this again. When the oval window moves inwards, the circular window moves the opposite way. This sounds good to me, so I had to fix it. I'll mark a false. Let's keep on trucking. The acoustic impedance of the inner ear and the outer ear are similar. And this should really scream out that it doesn't make any sense because we know that this is an aqueous solution and we know that the outside is air because we're not, we're really inside air when we're walking around the street. We're not any, in anything else. So uh, hopefully we're not. So the acoustic impetus of the inner ear that would be, and I would mark, I would say liquid. And the outer ear, I would say, I would say air are the same. Let's read it again. The acoustic impetus of liquid and air are the same. That, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. So I would mark it false. The acoustic, the acoustic impedance of the inner ear and the outer ear are not similar. Very good. We're going to keep on going. Got a lot of falses going on here. Hopefully, uh, hopefully there's something that may be true. There's going to be, oh, there's quite a bit a lot. So let's, we're going to move this. We're going to actually move this. Move this so we can actually read it in one go. Actually, let's see what I can do with this. I'm just going to move this. As I'm moving around, I should have probably prepared for this a little bit earlier, but hopefully it's not too bad. All right, let's give it a go. Let's try this. Applying higher sound intensity within the acoustic hearing range ooh, for a given frequency will always result in a higher sensation of loudness. All right, I'm going to have to read this again. Applying higher sound intensities, and really, let's just have the graph in front of us. I really like having this graph. And I'm looking and trying to solve, solve this, whole, this whole thing, namely because I haven't really encountered this question. So I'm kind of solving it on the go, hopefully not making an idiot out of myself. So let's give it another go. <clears throat> applying higher sound intensities, applying higher sound intensities really means going up this y-axis. So going up this y-axis within the acoustic hearing range, that means Within, uh, within this side and this side, really within this acoustic hearing range. Okay, so far so good. For a given frequency will always result in a higher sensation of loudness. Let's see what we mean. If we take a given frequency and we go up the, uh, the intensity axis, the y-axis within this range, just going up and up and up, and will result will always result in higher sensation of loudness. And when we're talking about sensation of loudness, we're really talking about this, these, this ladder here. So the higher I am on this ladder, the more, the more the sensation is going to be that we have a louder sound. So this is going to be perceived as louder, louder than that. So I'm going, to take, I'm going to take this frequency and I'm going to climb up the y-axis. Climb up the y-axis. And whenever I climb up this axis, I would always have a louder uh, appearing sound, a uh, sound that perceived as louder. Always, always. So applying more intensity for a given frequency, maybe this one, for a given frequency would always result in the sensation of a louder sound. So I would have to read it again and see if it makes sense to me. Let's see. Applying higher sound intensity within the acoustic hearing range for a given frequency will always result in higher sensation of loudness. I would have to a higher rating on the font scale does not constitute a higher sensation of loudness. And this actually, actually this, <laughs> this has something to do with the last thing that we just worked on. A higher rating on the font scale does not constitute a higher sensation of loudness. Let's see. If I have, whoa, what a mess. If I have this, like 110 fonts, let's just say 110 fonts, and let's just say I, I pick two different frequencies, uh, 20 hertz and 200 hertz. 
that have 110 fonts, and I take, I take them here, they would seem uh, this, the, the exact same loudness level to me. They would seem the exact same loudness level to me. So really anything on this isometric curve, and that's what we mean by isometric curve, anything here would have the same loudness, loudness associated with it. So let's see if that's what they mean. A higher rating on the phone scale does not constitute a higher sensation of loudness. And this doesn't make any sense because if I have zero fawn, it's my threshold of hearing. And if I have 40 fawns or 60 or 80, it's definitely, it would definitely seem louder to me. So we'll read it again. A high rating on the fawn scale constitutes, constitutes a higher sensation of loudness. This makes sense to me because I had to fix it. And I'll just mark a big fat false here. Very good. I really hope that, uh, that resolving these issues via answering questions makes a little bit more of a positive impact on understanding the material, and hopefully this helped a little bit. See you in the next video.